Okay, this is the second classical problem from the final exam of Physics 106 from 2023-24 academic year. Uh, in this problem, we have a coaxial cable that consists of you know, two cylindrical shells. So one, this, the other like that. These are extending, and probably we can assume they are infinite to make our calculations easier. Uh, the inner radius is A, the outer radius is B. They are carrying some currents. So the inner one is carrying a current I this way. The outer one is carrying a current I in the opposite direction. So this is a typical usage of coaxial cable. In this configuration, the coaxial cable is going to completely shield the magnetic field. There's also a cross-sectional view, which might be more useful, but I'm not going to redraw it here. The currents are distributed uniformly over the cross-sections of each conductor. So these are conducting shells, the cylindrical shells. Uh, express your answer in terms of quantities, blah, blah. Okay. Drive an expression for the magnitude of the magnetic field B at points in the region uh, R between A and B, that is the outside inner solar conductor, but inside the tube. Answer without derivation steps shown will be given no credit. Okay, so I think I will actually draw the cross section. This is going to be helpful. This is A and this is B. So this is an application of Ampere's law. And I have a current coming, uh, coming towards me over here, and a current going that direction over there. Um, so this is the application of Ampere's law, and I'm going to choose, so I, I want to find the magnetic field in this region, uh, R between A and B, so I'm going to choose an Amperian loop so assume that these are all circles. My circles are horrible, but hopefully you can actually uh, figure out what I'm trying to draw. So my imperial loop is going to look like this. So I'm going to choose the direction of this curve. Uh, it has to have a direction uh, this way. So it's actually uh, this current inside is going to make a positive contribution. Now for that one, I can write Ampere's law. Okay. So I can get the full credit by showing the derivation steps. L is mu naught. I enclosed. Now, these are all you know, uh, currents, so the magnetic field to currents are in terms of, are in forms of loops. Uh, in this case, because they're cylindrical symmetry, those loops have to be circles, so mag magnetic field is going to be a circle. And no, that the circle has to be centered on the symmetry axis, again, because of cylindrical symmetry. Uh, I'm going to have a circle uh, over here, and I'm going to assume that the magnetic field is in the same direction as my loop, so I can just write this is a simple product. This DL element and magnetic field, they're all parallel to each other at every point. B is constant because of cynical symmetry. So I can take this out and then this integral is now trivial. This is two pi r. On the right-hand side, I simply have I. The outer current does not contribute. Okay, it's outside, so uh, it doesn't contribute. But if I was actually up, way outside, then it would contribute and the total current enclosed would be zero. That would lead to a zero magnetic field. And we can just solve for this. B uh, is mu naught over 2 pi i over r. Okay. And if you want, we can indicate the direction of this magnetic field as this way. Okay. That's appropriate. Uh, actually, they're asking for the magnitude, so you don't need to calculate the direction. Calculate the self-inductance L per small l per unit length of the coaxial cable. Okay. So uh, we can keep this in mind. I'm going to erase this, but we can just do this. Now for this one, we are going to actually choose. Uh, so how, how does this work? Now, uh, first of all, the formula that we are going to use that's suitable for determining the in self inductance of a circuit element is that the total flux through that circuit element is the self inductance times the current passing through it. Okay. There is, as you might remember, another formula that, that you obtain by taking the time derivative of this, where it relates the EMF to rate of change of current, but that's not very suitable for, uh, for a theoretical determination. That's used for experimental determination, typically. Okay. So over here, we have a single loop. Okay. So this is just one. This goes away. And we are going to calculate the flux. Hopefully, it's going to be proportional to the current. The currents are going to go away. Uh, there's going to be some length factor. We're going to move the length factor to the denominator of the self-inductance, and we're going to get our answer. So what kind of flux? So flux requires an area. What kind of area are we going to have? Well, the area looks like this. Okay. This is, in fact, 
very similar, if not identical, to one of the suggested problems or examples in the book. So this is how we are going to, we are going to look at the uh, flux. So for this, for this loop, we are going to have some magnetic field that is going into this loop. These are all crosses, you can't see them. And uh, I'm going to give some length to this. So it's going to have some length L, but the height is going to be simply B minus A. And so that is going to be fine. Now to calculate the flux, uh, just like the previous problem, we typically use you know, flux is equal to E times A, but here we can't use it because the magnetic field actually depends on R. It depends on how far from we are from the symmetry axis, so it's a bit stronger here and a bit weaker here. So what we need to do is that we have to divide this uh, into little parts and then calculate the little flux in each part and add them up. And a summation of an infinite number of infinitesimal parts is going to be an integration. So that's how it's going to look like. Now, that V phi is now going to be the magnetic field times some dA. And so we are going to choose some little dA over here. Just like the previous problem, the strategy is to actually choose a little area like this. Right? And I'm going to choose a, a coordinate system that looks like this again. So this thickness is going to be simply dr, and my dA here is going to be L times dr. Okay? And the magnetic field is given by this. So let's proceed. So uh, this flux is going to be B dA, but that B is mu naught over two pi I over R. dA is L times dr times dr, and the limits are from A to B. A to B. Uh, these are constants, I can take them out. I'm going to have the integral of one over R, which is a natural logarithm. Uh, these limits are going to uh, enter that natural logarithm. I'm going to have a difference of logarithms, which is a logarithm of ratios, so I can actually write this down directly. Mu naught I over two pi L, ln b over a. Okay. This is something hopefully I've done many times at this point, so it's actually automatic. Uh, so this is the flux, uh, and on the right-hand side, we have L times i, uh, i's go away. They're asking for not the uh, inductance, uh, but the inductance per unit length, so I'll move the small l to uh, over here. L over small l is going to be mu naught over two pi ln b over a, okay? And uh, this is in fact the answer given over here. Now for part C, what's the energy u over l stored per unit length of the coaxial cable? Okay. So they're asking for, let's keep this maybe. They're asking for the energy per unit length. Okay. Now there are a couple of ways Solve this one, so this is capital L, okay, rather than energy density, it's a capital L per unit length, energy per unit length. Uh, one way is what's given in the answer sheet, that this is a straightforward application, that the energy stored in an inductor is, uh, is one half L I squared, and you just make the substitution and get your answer uh, that way. Uh, because I is given, L is something over there, we can just, uh, no, this, this is really simple, it's, uh, it's just this times uh, I squared divided by two. Another way will be that uh, maybe you don't remember this, maybe you want to, this didn't occur to you, so I'll show an alternate way, is to start from the energy density. So this is small u, is one half uh, B squared by mu naught. Now, to do this, you have to actually calculate the magnetic field at each point, get a uh, infinitesimal volume and then multiply it by this and then integrate. Now why? Because the magnetic field is not constant, so you can't just uh, you know, start with this and say that u is equal to, so capital U is equal to small u times, uh, sorry, small u times the volume. You can't do this because the u is not constant, because b is not constant, but what you can do is that this small u is going to be some integral of these guys and these are going to be small u times 
some dB. This is not the potential difference, this is the volume. Okay? So for that U, we have an expression. Okay? U is this thing over here, so we can actually calculate this because we have an expression for magnetic field as well. What about dV? Now that dV is going to be some infinitesimal cylindrical shell. So let me try to draw this over here. So it's something like this. Okay? So it goes over here, inside. Okay? So it's some cyn uh, cylindrical shell of thickness dr and of radius r. Okay? So I'm going to be, I'm referring to the cylindrical shells that add up to this complete volume with, uh, from the inner conductor to the outer conductor. I need to calculate that volume, and then within those volumes, the magnetic field is constant, so energy density is constant. I can multiply the energy density at R with the volume at R, and uh, so this is dr actually, with the volume at R, and then I can just add these up. I can integrate these and get the total energy. Okay, this is the idea. So the question is then, what is this volume? Well, this, you can take this volume and open this up. It's going to become uh, like a rectangular sheet with some thickness. That thickness is dr. The surface area is whatever is the length times the, uh, the circumference of the circle. Okay, so it looks like a rectangle when you open this up. It's going to open up to something like this. So this is L, this is 2 pi r. Okay, and the thickness over here is dr. You open this up, you get something like this. So the volume, dv, is actually uh, 2 pi r l times dr. Okay, so let's proceed. We know B, so we know U, we know dV, and we are going to just integrate this from A to B, just like we did before. Okay, so uh, let me erase this, and let me erase this as well. Uh, the potential U dV is going to be one half. So B square uh, is mu naught square over four pi square I square over R square. This is what we, I have an additional mu naught coming from over here and this additional one over two from there times my dV is two pi R L dr. Now there are some cancellations happening here. So this cancels one of these, this becomes two pi. This cancels one of these and this cancels one of those and I have um, the, I'll take the constants out. Uh, this is the constants out is mu naught i square over two times two pi is four pi. And I have an L coming from here. Now, all I left inside is one over r. This integral is from a to b, and we already know what the, that integral amounts to. So this is ln b over r. So this will be your total energy if you wanted to calculate it this way, starting from the energy density formula and then choosing some appropriate volume over which the energy density is constant, multiplying this, getting the total energy in that volume and then integrate it to get the total energy over there. Now finally, we have to move this over here to get u over L. Uh, the energy itself is infinite, but the uh, energy per unit length is in fact constant and this is the answer given. Uh, the heat, it's not P over R, it's P over A. Okay. Except for that, this is the same thing. And uh, the calculation in the answer sheet given is done the other way by making, uh, by making use of the formula one half L I square. It gives the same answer as you would expect.